Um, my name is Christina Hartzell. I'm the communications coordinator for ADK Action, and I've been in communication with a lot of you about our Pollinator Happy Hour series. Um, I'm so excited to be here um, together today, actually, with uh, ADK Action's executive director, Brittany Christensen, um, who's at the other end of my porch. We are joining you from outdoors uh, in the beautiful town of Keysville on this sunny, warm Adirondack day. So I know you'll forgive any wind noise. We just couldn't resist being right by the side of the garden for our third and final pollinator happy hour. Um, so to get things started, before I turn things over to Brittany and our other pollinator project partners and our guest expert, it is happy hour. So uh, we have a couple of themed beverages to share with you today. Um, and we've got them related, of course, to some of our favorite pollinators. So first of all, the gray hair streak butterfly, unlike most butterflies, does not prefer one specific habitat. It's a common butterfly found throughout most of the United States. Um, and if you want to attract more gray hair streaks to your garden, it's beneficial to plant goldenrod, milkweed, and mint. Um, in the Northeast, we start to see gray hair streaks, I think around in May, around the same time that I've got a lot of rhubarb happening. So even though rhubarb doesn't have much to do with the gray hair streak, we've made this beverage that has, it's just lemonade with some rhubarb concentrate that we picked up at the Hub on the Hill in Essex, New York, um, though it's also at the pharmacy in Keysville and many other places, or you can make your own. So it's a nice way to make the lemonade a little more tart for um, you know a more mature, refined palate. I have a gray hair streak, so I just associate it with that. Um, other beverage that we've made today, which is the cocktail, the gray hair streak is the mocktail. Uh, so our other featured pollinator is the Baltimore checker spot um, butterfly. And so the uh, feed almost exclusively on white turtle head. So if you ordered white turtle head in our plant sale and you're picking up next week, you are going to be providing a valuable nursery for this pollinator. The Baltimore checker spot was named after the same Lord Baltimore from whom Baltimore, Maryland gets its name. And in fact, in 1973, the Baltimore checker spot was named the official insect of Maryland. So in honor of this pollinator's ties to Maryland, we're drinking a version of the Baltimore Orange Crush, which is fresh squeezed, very important orange juice, um, a little bit of vodka and triple sec, and it's topped with lemon lime soda. Usually we're big, uh, advocates of eating local. This is not a very local beverage, but it is delicious and it really hits the checker spot. Sorry for all the puns. I'm going to turn it over now to Brittany and uh, I'll be talking to you at the end. Thank you so much, Christina. Um, it's so nice to have a punny friend because I also enjoy a pun or two myself. And um, Christina has done such a lovely job with these cocktails. She was just squeeze squeezing fresh oranges in the kitchen before we hopped on. So thank you again and cheers. And cheers to all of you. And if you didn't make the recipe yet, we will send out the recipe afterwards so you can enjoy these uh, cocktails and mocktails as well. Um, as Christina mentioned, I'm the executive director of ADK Action. My name again is Brittany Christensen, for those of you who don't know me. And um, ADK Action is a nonprofit serving the entire Adirondack region. Our strength is really in our projects. We take on projects that address unmet needs, promote vibrant communities, and preserve the natural beauty of the Adirondacks. So we're really about fulfilling that promise of the Adirondacks as a place where human and humans and nature can thrive together. And the project that we're focused on today, of course, is the Pollinator Project. And the Pollinator Project empowers people to take individual and collective action to ensure a future where pollinators can thrive, native habitat abounds, and where Adirondack residents and visitors are engaged pollinator advocates. And so that's all of you, you're our engaged pollinator advocates. So everyone who's gardening for pollinators, putting out water for pollinators, not using pesticides for pollinators, thank you for all that you do. And thank you for joining us today to learn a little bit more. 
Now, ADK Action has been working with three amazing organizations, our, our core partners on the Pollinator Project um, since its inception in 2016. So I just want to acknowledge and thank um, our friends at the Wild Center, Lake Placid Land Conservancy, and Common Ground Gardens, um, as well as Paul Smith College. Um, Common Ground Gardens was an early, um, sorry, there's a loud vehicle going by. Can you all hear me okay? Give me a thumbs up if you can hear me. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Um, so I, I want to turn it over and let some of our partners say a word or two. So Jen Kretzer from the Wild Center, I see that you're on the call. Would you like to say anything about your work with the Pollinator Project? Sure. Thanks so much, Brittany. And hi, everybody. I'm Jen Kretzer. I'm the Director of Climate Initiatives for the Wild Center, and we've been a proud partner of the Pollinator Project since the very beginning and have dedicated a lot of uh, time and energy to making sure that visitors to the museum are able to see our pollinator gardens, participate in programs, um, partner on lectures and events and um, in the plant sale and all kinds of things. So we're big um, fans of the project and we uh, look forward to continued partnership and hope everybody's garden right now is uh, thriving. Thanks, Jen. Thanks for being here today. We love working with you as well. And if you haven't been to the Wild Center, go visit them this summer. Um, all of the habitat at the Wild Center is native. So it's a really beautiful place to see native, native pollinator habitat in action. Um, I also want to thank our friends from Lake Placid Land Conservancy. I don't think that they're on the call. If you, if you are on the call, please interrupt me and chime in. But, um, but I just want to say that Lake Placid Land Conservancy has a wonderful land conservation program. They work with um, homeowners uh, with, with uh, I think it's 50 acres or more to come up with habitat plans to support pollinators. And they have some really wonderful um, programs as well where they encourage citizen science and they do trainings with the iNaturalist app. So if you haven't downloaded iNaturalist yet, it's this amazing app that you can use to identify uh, plants and pollinators and other animals using the camera on your phone. So if you're ever out for a walk and you see a beautiful flower and you wanna know her name, you can figure it out using the app. Um, so thanks to our friends at Lake Placid Land Conservancy. And then Paul Smith College is our other major partner. And of course they have the Butterfly House at the Vic in Paul Smith, New York. And they also have um, naturalists and they do great interpretive walks. So another great place for pollinator enthusiasts to visit and learn more. Um, now I would love to go ahead and introduce our guest speaker today for this third and final pollinator happy hour. Um, today we've got Jackie Whelan joining us, and Jackie is the owner of Mossbrook Roots Flower Farm and the co-owner of Mossbrook Landscaping. Um, Jackie um, heads up the landscape design department at Mossbrook Landscaping, and she's a certified landscape installer. And so it's very fitting today that she's our expert for um, this, this um, session, which is really focused on installing your pollinator gardens. So welcome, Jackie, and thank you for joining us. For having me. And do you want to tell us a little bit about where you are right now? Sure. I'm sitting in our uh, flower farm store, which is on Mace Chasm Road. So my husband and I started Mossbrook Landscaping uh, 15 years ago, I guess. It was just him and I, and we've grown the company to great leaps and bounds, which has been fantastic for us, which allowed us, we had a, we had a lot of property here on the Mace Chasm Road, and it was always kind of a passion of mine to, to grow cut flowers for florist use and weddings and farmers markets and all of that. And so we kind of started the project as the Mossbrook Roots Flower Farm five years ago. This is our fifth growing season. Um, and we started off kind of small and now we've definitely expanded, um, you know, not obviously as much as possible because we have a lot of plans ahead of things, but we are, um, you know, talking about new greenhouses and we put up another high tunnel and um, a lot of things we've opened a second location on uh, Boynton Avenue that will be um, hopefully sustained with our farm cut flowers. We started the farm originally um, thinking that we would be great for wholesale um, supplies like for flowers for the local florists um, but it's turned into so much more than that from you picks and as they said farmers markets full-time florist services um, right through the Christmas season um, and obviously you know you know anything we can do too as far as you know helping the pollinators um, we do everything organically in our farm here so it's uh, it's just kind of a win-win for everybody and just really a fun job to have <laughs> and a fun business that we've created. 
Thank you, Jackie. And for those of you who've joined us on some of the past pollinator happy hours, you know that first we um, we covered um, selecting the plants, getting to know and identify the common native flowering plants for pollinator gardens. Um, that was back in April. And then in May, um, we had Kim Ironman as our featured speaker and we talked about planning your pollinator garden. So we really went over, you know, clusters of, um, of similar habitats so the pollinators have an easier time finding the flower, flower groupings. We talked about, you know, not mowing towards the edges of woodlands. We talked about creating pollinator islands, um, things of that nature. And now today what we're really focused on is the nuts and bolts of how do you actually, you know, you pick up all your plants from the garden center. How do you actually install your pollinator garden? What are some best practices for transplanting those plants? Do you add compost? Do you not and add compost. Um, so, you know, and of course, all of your questions. So we only have an hour together today and we're already 12 minutes into it. So what we really want to hear from you is what are your questions about installing your pollinator garden? Um, and, you know, and really any other questions as well. We do have um, a lot of pollinator expertise on the call. So we'll kind of group think and try to help anyone through any challenges. Um, so please feel free if you if you want to pop a question in the chat we will address it um, if you feel comfortable also taking yourself off mute and, and turning on your video you can ask yourself as well I guess I can kind of answer Brittany's first question about compost or not compost I say definitely compost um, anything we can do to enrich the soils, especially if you have sandy soils, non-nutrient rich soils, you know, even if it's just the first year or so um, to uh, enrich your soils with a good organic compost. But with that being said, you want to really make sure where your compost is coming from, um, make sure it is organic. It's not just the run of the mill, you know, someone had some wood chips left over, they let things die down um, because who knows, you know, how those wood chips were treated. There are a lot of practices out there, um, you know, obviously with pesticides, herbicides, and all of those things. Um, you just really want to know, make sure you know where your material is coming from. That's definitely, and also, I mean, it just as you know, as I said, you really want to enrich that soil, give your pollinators the best chance that you you can off that first growing season. Um, so I'm I'm all for organic compost, absolutely. Add a lot of good oxygen to the soil and just that really great nutrients that that those pollinators need. That's great, Jake. Jackie. Thank you so much. Um, we just got a question about the the plant pickup at the Vic. Um, will there be some directions with the plants I pick up? So, so yes, we um, we had record sales with the pollinator plant sale this year, and we're really excited to see many of you at pickup next week. We have fact sheets on each plant um, in the sale, so you will have instructions for care and for planting. Um, some of them don't have things as specific as you know how much uh, nutrient they would like in different categories, but we will provide you with a fact sheet. Um, I have another question here from Kathy. So Kathy says, I'm totally new to gardening. Um, I have the seeds from the ADK Action uh, website and I will also buy some plants. I'm starting from scratch and I wanna get rid of the grass first. Um, I read that you can um, put plant right away on compost and leaves after cardboard has been laid out underneath. So that's called sheet mulching. Other resource suggests to wait a number of months and then plant in the fall. Is there much of an advantage to waiting a number of months or can I lay out the cardboard, the compost and leaves now and plant right away? So Jackie, have you ever used sheet, the sheet mulching technique and do you have any tips? Yeah, we have, we, we have. It's not a common practice with us in our landscaping company or with the flower farm only because we, are, we do have the machines and equipment and all that stuff to enrich our soils. We test our soils with Cornell every season um, to see what we need to add and things like that. So I haven't, and we also use a weed barrier uh, fabric at the farm just you know, to kind of minimize that because we are farming over two acres. But absolutely, as far as sure, if you wait longer, more organics are going to break down and enrich your soil, but you could plant right away. I would, you know, I mean, you're not going to want to plant your seeds in, into the fall because it won't, it won't have enough time to germinate, establish themselves, and it won't be as an effective pollinator garden. You're, if, if you have seeds, um, definitely, I would recommend planting in the, in the springtime. Now is great, just as far as germination rates. 
and your, um, you know, your, your full flowering rates, you know, you, you want to be able, we have short seasons up here anyway. So I would definitely recommend planting um, now. And the biggest thing there is you said you had the, had the lawn that you want to remove, remove a good four to five inches of sod off. Those sod roots can be very um, invasive, not, you know, not, so much invasive, but you know, they're, they're aggressive. So they will, it's kind of a long process to get sod completely removed. So it is best to remove, you know, a, a good depth of four to five inches of getting that first sod layer off before applying the cardboard and, and the, you know, that sheet mulching for sure. Great. Thanks, Jackie. Um, Howard wants to know if you can recommend a good source for bulk organic compost in the Adirondacks. Mossbrook Landscaping has it right here in our yard, uh, but we don't sell it by the bag. We do sell it in bulk by, by the yard. Um, we do deliver and we also, um, you can do pickup at our farm. Um, we sell it by the yard. It's $60 a yard. It is all plant-based organic compost. It comes out of the Finger Lakes region. And we do have the tech spec sheets on that as well. Um, I'm not sure where else. The one thing to be careful of is when you go to farms and get that, you just want to make sure that it's aged enough that the nitrogen contents are not too high so you're not burning the roots of your plants. And do you deliver to the central Adirondacks? No, we do not. Uh, the, I mean, we go to Lake Placid, we go out that way. I guess it would depend on, you know, delivery costs and things like that, but we do store, we do um, always have it bulk in our yard. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, we, so I just wanted to also say that we, um, we oftentimes encourage folks to, to stop mowing or reduce mowing in parts of their yard. And then um, I think a lot of folks are interested in this sheet mulching method because of the no-till um, practices and just kind of keeping that soil intact. But at the same time, there are certainly situations when, when, land, when the landscaping features that you're trying to achieve in your yard do require some tillage and some direct installation into the ground. So I think that whenever possible, you know, thinking through all your options and trying to maximize pollinator benefit while also achieving the type of results that you're looking for. Um, you know, it's like we can, we can make some compromises. Um, and I have a question about um, slopes. So on my own property, we, uh, we just built a new house two and a half years ago. And when we put in the road, because we, we have a relatively, um, it's like a hillside and the road goes up into the hillside. So we've got some erosion trying to happen and we've got um, a relatively steep hillside and I've planted pollinator seeds um, into it every year, but they're not, they're not really taking hold as much as I would like. Do you have any recommendations for me? The slopes are always the hardest questions because, because as you said, it just naturally wants to erode. If you can decrease your slope at all, that is obviously the number one option to do, whether you can put a small boulders at the bottom to, in, you know, to increase that elevation and decrease that, that slope is the best thing. But sometimes you have to go more with your native shrubs, things like that, that have a more of an established root system to try to establish your bank first. Um, something like a low grow sumac or something like that. It's, it's, it's very aggressive. The root systems will establish quickly and then they'll try to, it'll support that erosion. Um, and then so sometimes it's good to establish um, larger shrubs and then be able to um, add in the extra seeds and, and smaller perennials um, and annual things like that to try to maintain that, um, you know, lack of, you know, and, and deter any erosion. That's really helpful. Thank you. Um, we have a question from Kathy. She wants to know if she can use horse manure. Horse manure is okay. You just want to make sure it's aged horse manure. Um, I would say for at least eight to 12 months, you would you are going to want to use it unless you're cutting it with something, um, mixing it in with some other soils. But the, that's the biggest thing is, is that is that content, that nitrogen contents in the, in the manures. Um, but horse manure is great. We use it. We have a farmer down the road that we, we go and grab it from and we mix it into some of our soils, um, but we make sure it ages, you know, a good, a good season before we, we put it right into our gardens. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so Kathy, or no, let's see, this one is from Betsy. Betsy is looking for ideas for creating a nice edge to her pollinator garden. Do you have any recommendations there? Um, there, I mean, there's, I mean, kind of the possibilities there. I mean, there's a lot of them. Um, 
Riverstone is great depending on how natural you want to do. We don't recommend the like a plastic edging by any means because it, it does it it's obviously it's just not good for the environment. It doesn't break down. Um, it, it doesn't hold up really well in our freeze and thaws. Um, the best thing to do is probably be able to try to edge it with some kind of stone to keep it as natural as possible. It just kind of goes with the aesthetics of, of a native, you know, and pollinator garden as well. Um, if you use something like wood, it, it will break down. But then the other advantage to that is it, it will provide, you know, habitats for the pollinators to live, you know, over the winter as well. I mean, driftwood, things like that, it all is adding good habitats for the, for the pollinators. Um, so it's really just an aesthetic, you know, choice at that point. But I, I, my recommendation, I would say keep it as natural as possible. That's great. Thank you. And a similar question. So Mary wants to know about mulching. And there are a lot of ground nesting pollinators that need access to some bare ground. But at the same time, you have to balance that with weed control, right? So can you we talk do. a little bit about mulching? Yeah, I think mulching is one of those kind of uh, constant discussions with pollinator gardens. Because as you as you said, Brittany, you know you want to be able to keep bare ground open. You also want to be able to provide water for your for your pollinators. Um, but the mulch again, it really makes a difference of where you get it from. Um, you want to stay away from anything with dyes in it, um, and just really knowing where your mulch comes from. Um, I've read a lot of things in, in my research about you want more of a shredded mulch than a than a like a, a pine bark mulch, but then definitely leaving bare ground areas as well. And there's certain and then there's certain plants too that don't love mulch around them. You know, what I mean, so you always want to keep the mulch a little bit away from the base of your plants. Um, but it, it does certainly mulch is a is a great thing in our world or in my and also in my mind because it does add more organics that breaks it down. But again, can't stress enough the you know making sure you know where your materials are coming from, so you're not doing more damage, you know, and, and harming any of any of the pollinators that we're we're hoping to help. Yeah, that's helpful. Thank you. Um, we had a question here uh, from Jackie. Do you always have to remove grass to plant pollinator plants? You don't have to. Um, I, I don't think you have to um, by any means, but. Grass, as I said, is aggressive and you want your plants to become established. And sometimes when you're trying to establish new plants, depending on you know, the size of the plants you're bringing in, if you're just doing seeds, um, a lot of times that grass can, can choke things out. Um, you know, so a lot of times, you know, obviously you know, the no-till method and, and things like that is, is great. I mean, I, I'm thinking about you know, my lawn, I embrace my ajuga and I embrace my, um, my uh, dandelions and all of those things that grow up early in the spring. Um, you know, so it, you certainly can do it. It's just a matter of, it's not gonna be an overnight uh, establishment for your pollinators. It's definitely something it is better to start with larger plants. Um, you know, I'm not, I'm not saying they have to be big three gallon, you know, native perennials. You could probably get away with one gallons, even quart pots, but I, I, I don't know with seeds going directly into to grass, it would take much longer to establish that pollinator garden because the grass will choke out the um, those those pollinator seeds. At least in my experience. Yeah, mine as well. Sometimes I have better luck when I sow sow them over the snow because then they have the chance to reach the ground first before the right. ground is established. But it's yeah. still a multi-year process. Absolutely. Yeah. Gardening is a process that everyone just has to expect that it's. You know, it's kind of, uh, you know, it's, you have to be in it for the long haul. Yeah. Well, you caught Jen Kretzer's attention with the driftwood as kind of a natural edging. And she was mm -hmm. wondering if you had any other um, suggestions for other natural materials that, that you might want to put around a pollinator garden to provide edging. Hmm. I, I, you know, driftwood is really is a is a great way to you know do things. You know, I it's definitely. I mean, a lot of people we we use like four by fours of, of cedar in the past. Nothing pressure treated. We don't want to put any of you know any of those chemicals in, into the ground as well. Um, but any you know natural wood, you could use cedar stakes. That works as well too. Again, just, you know, honestly, we want, you want broken down kind of material, again, just adding more, um, you know, habitats for the, for the pollinators. So anything like that, that's kind of, 
um, starting to decay. I know it's it's an awful thing to, to think about when you want these beautiful, you know, pristine gardens. But I, I think with the pollinators too, with natives, I think you really you we're different gardeners, I, I guess. And that's in a, you know in our landscaping world, we have found a, such a trend for people wanting to to create these pollinators and native gardens. Um, you know, so that that trend is growing, and so it's making us as landscapers think outside of the box with some some different things as well. And so every year we're learning, just like all of all of you guys are as well, as far as the best practices with that. Thank you. One other thing I've seen that I'll throw in there is like um, three inch rounds of wood, kind of buried mm -hmm. as the edging as well. And that looks yeah, nice. absolutely. Look. Absolutely. Just you just you just have to be aware, you know, I mean, over over time that will continue to break down. But again, you know, then we can just replace that wood, you know, and, and it's it's pretty cheap, you know, as far as, you know, as far as materials go, much, much less expensive when I mean, you go out to your woods and try to find some larger, larger, um, you know, tree material, tree limbs, things like that. Um, you know, obviously anything like that woodpeckers have, have gotten into, beavers have cut down, you know, let's reuse and recycle that stuff. Um, just knowing that over time, the more wind, the more water, the more sun, you know, that wood will break down as well and it will need to be replaced, you know, but that's, again, you're just adding more natural habitat. Yeah, it's a good sign when things break down. Exactly, that that's what we want to do, right? That's exactly what we want it to do. Yeah. So it's maintenance. I mean, that's the thing too. I mean, these pollinator gardens, they're, they they do require maintenance until they, you know, can establish themselves. And uh, then then hopefully after a few years, then we can just enjoy them. But it is, it's, it's gardening work and we, we've got to, you know, put the effort in. That's great. Um, so I had a question here. Um, let's see from Lar Larissa. Hi, Larissa. I'm glad you could join us today. Um, she wants to know about best practices for harvesting her own native seeds. Um, she has a lot of successful milkweed and wants to help it along. Oh, goodness. That is not my great expertise area by, by any means. Um, I you know, I mean, I think in every seed is really different. So that I don't really have a great answer for. Um, it's that's just we don't we don't cultivate for for seeds here so it's that's just not something I know I apologize the best advice I can give you is let the plant tell you when it's ready um, in the fall once the pods dry enough and start to open on their own and once the um, you know the kind of cool scaly seed pod of the milkweed when it's easy to separate and um, and the fibers are no longer wet that's when it's ready and the milkweed needs stratification. So it needs to go through those cold winter months to sprout. Um, and then other, likewise with other native um, plants that you find in the wild, you'll wanna wait until their seed heads are, are nice and dry. And when they're easy to harvest, that they're ready to harvest. So if you can kind of gently put your hand over the head of an echinacea and those seeds just start to fall out, then you know it's the time. And um, Jen has, Jen from the Wild Center here, has a beautiful garden with a huge milkweed stand. So Jen, what has helped you help those milkweed along in your garden? Yeah, I was actually just adding that in the chat. Thanks, <clears throat> Brittany. Um, I've actually had a lot of success in um, transplanting milkweed when it's really, really little because they have a long lateral root. And so it, it's very easy to um, cut that rat, you know, inadvertently like cut that um, lateral root and then the milkweed will die. But if you transplant them when they're like six inches or less, like I literally have like 30 or 40 plants at least now in my yard and I started with two. So it was between kind of the, um, you know, using the milkweed seeds that we had started with, with the pollinator project a number of years ago to like finding seeds in other places. <laughs> like I've been trying all kinds of stuff, but the transplanting has actually worked really well for me. And, and now's a good time to find it because it's just, it's just coming up. Um, but just be very, make sure you like dig down like really gently with your fingers and find that lateral root and trace it to the very end. Cause if you cut it, it will, they won't grow. Where are you finding the um, milkweed that you're transplanting? Where are you grabbing them from? I just find them along the like sandy bits along the road, like ditches and stuff along the road, like literally like walking, walking around. That's great. Thank you, Jen. Sure. Um, 
we've had some various questions about kind of ground cover and like um, lawn alternative types of plants. Um, I, I'm sorry if I'm, I'm not familiar with ajuga. Did I pronounce that correctly? Okay. Um, ajuga and dandelion. What other plants like ajuga and dandelion and clover can people plant in their yards for the pollinators? Um, red and white clover is, is great. Um, there is a yarrow, Y-A-R-R-O-W. There's a ground cover yarrow that's fantastic. Um, different ground cover sedums, creeping thyme, anytime you can get any kind of, um, you know, creeping, any kind of herbs because they do bloom. Uh, the, the, like the ajuga, for example, it's one of the earliest blooming um, ground covers that are found in the lawn. There's, it's got like a little purple flat leaf to it and then it, and it blooms purple as well. Um, it is just, it's a flurry with, with bees come the springtime because it's one of the the um, first thing, but when we all do alternative um, lawn methods for people, we just, we've done quite a few in the city. It has been mostly the different clovers, yarrow, sedum, ajuga, and the creeping thyme is usually the mix that we do in, in those alternate lawns. It's great, no mowing, no, not, you know, it's, it's, it's awesome <laughs> and it's beautiful. I mean, it's just like a sea of purple throughout the seasons and it, it, it keeps rotating through. It's, it's really nice. That sounds lovely. All right, we've run out of questions in the chat for the moment. Um, I, I wonder when, um, so this year we've decided to go with a slightly different um, plant size and style for our pollinator plant sales. So, in past years, um, we've um, grown um, from seed or from plugs and then sized them up into the one gallon pots. Um, but this year we wanted to be able to sell more of the plants to get more habitat created, have the prices be lower, and also reduce our own hands-on time with the plant sale because we were outgrowing our space and capacity. So we're actually selling them quickly. Up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it always happens quickly. You always think you have enough space. <laughs> Yeah, you fill right up, right? So we're selling this year the landscape plugs that are um, about this size. I don't know if that's like, I think they're like four inches by uh, two, by an inch and a half on the top. Um, and so I know that we're going to get a lot of questions about, you know, the best way to plant those. And I can kind of foresee that there might be challenges with knowing how to space them when they start so small, making sure you provide enough space because we all know how much. Right. Yeah. So what would you say for folks that are trying to plant their landscape plugs in their gardens? What's your advice? Typically, I mean, a landscape plug, we usually, I mean, obviously it does definitely depend on the, the variety that, that they're planting, but a good rule of thumb is about six inches on center. That's probably the most common used for, for these landscape plugs with perennials. Because again, the whole purpose is to plant masses and clumps together to kind of make these bullseyes for these pollinators to find, you know, and keeping everything kind of grouped together. So it's okay to over plant, uh, you know, in this kind of situation, you're not looking for a foundation of your, you know, suburbia house kind of planting. We want these, we want these perennials to fill in. We want them to naturally keep the, the weeds out. So a six inch on center is, is probably a very average planting. What kind of containers are you, do you have them in? Are they in little peat containers? Are they in, in pots? What do you have them in that you've been growing? Um, they're in fifties and thirties. Oh, okay. So they're like in cell packs then. Yep. They're in cell packs. Okay. The big thing, you know, too, is, I mean, the one thing that we always, you know, as growers here, it's with my horticulturist that I have on staff, Carissa, she's very concerned, obviously, about root growth and healthy roots and all of those, you know, it's, it's a very important part of growing, especially from growing from seed. But when we go to plant these plants, we want to make sure that we give them the air that they need and to be able, you know, to kind of spread their roots, you know, to, to say. Um, so we want to make sure, like, if we, we break apart that soil, we, we make sure we get some um, movement and air going into those into those holes that we've we've so nicely prepared for them. One thing we don't want to do is you don't want to compact down around when you're planting. You want to leave um, you know that that oxygen rich soil that when you compact things down it doesn't allow for those roots to to freely find those open areas to, to spread themselves into so you know pea pots i know a lot of people and and i'm sure people will disagree with me on this too i take everything out of pea pots even though they tell me that you can you know plant those that pea in the ground i always take them out um, because it's just harder for those roots to try to push them those through them it takes a really um 
you know, it, it takes two seconds to take that, take it off. It's a great growing medium, but when we put things into the ground, we always take those off just so we can make sure those roots are able to easily be able to establish themselves. So as I said, you know, six inch on center, keep your soil nice and um, airy, um, you know, and, and just giving those roots the best chance to, to establish themselves as quickly as possible. And watering, watering is a huge, huge part of, of gardening. And especially next week, we're supposed to get in the 90s. Um, so everything's going to be really warm, um, you know, for that, especially because the plant pickup is on Saturday. So just make sure, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's a living thing and we, and you have to, you have to care for it. Thanks, Jackie. So when, um, when you take the plant out of the cell and you have got, if you've got some compaction and the roots are kind of bound, do you recommend breaking those apart? And how do you do that? So that I'm always scared when I do that, cause I don't want to tear the roots, but is, is it yeah. doing that with the risk of tearing the roots? No, it's, it's really not. I mean, plants are pretty resilient. Um, you know, they, they need minimal, you know, requirements, obviously, you know, soil, you know, nutrients and, and water, but the root systems, and that's what I was kind of joking with, with Carissa, the first time I took her out annual planting, she, she was having such a bit that I was like, just breaking up these roots and being so tough with them, because, you know, she worked so hard to get these beautiful roots and, and all of that stuff, but it, it actually is, is beneficial uh, to an extent. I mean, obviously don't like I mean, some people think I manhandle the, these root systems, but honestly, um, they they want to be able to separate and get in and get out of that that little pot that you're getting them in. So, remember, these plants are resilient um, for sure, and you probably can and uh, you know you, you aren't really hurting them too much. The big thing is you don't want to touch them right at the base, like where the root system starts. You don't want to touch right at that base of that that starting point because that is the most fragile part of these of these small little plants. Okay. Touch the roots more than you touch the leaves and the and the and the stems for sure. Got it. Okay, Charlotte wants to know about wild ginger ginger as ground. Ginger. Yeah. Love wild ginger. Love it. Love it. Love it. It's one of my favorite ground covers. Um, it does really well in shady areas. It's a very, you know, easily grown woodland plant. I wish I could, if I had done the Zoom meeting on, on my phone, I would have walked you down to see we have an amazing patch of um, wild ginger down below some of our, um, our, our trees where all of our bird feeders are and everything. And it's just, it's doing well. It's a, it's a great low growing ground cover, really great green color, kind of shiny, you know what I mean? And it just, it just, it does really well in this area, especially in woodland areas. Brittany, I think you're on mute. Sorry about that. Here you um, are. <laughs> so I don't know how long I was on mute. Did you hear me say, here's a picture of the wild ginger? Or were you all just like, what is that? <laughs> Sorry, we were just looking at the picture of the wild ginger. <laughs> okay, I just wanted to show what the wild ginger looked like for anyone who wasn't uh, familiar. And then, um, and then we got a question from Marty. You mentioned earlier that you don't like putting those peat pots right in the ground. So, do you actually compost those peat pots after? And does that do they break down I do. well? I do. Okay, I do. That's what I do with all of ours. That, right. and I don't know if that's a personal thing or, I mean, I, you know, as I, you know, I grew up gardening with my mom and she is, you know, and my grandmother and she was always just like, get rid of the peat pots. And I'm like, okay, I will. <laughs> so it, 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 it seems to have worked really well, but yes, definitely if you can compost those, that's, that's not a problem. Okay, great. Wonderful. Um, so another question that comes up for us a lot is, um, and this is kind of going a little bit down the line, not just installing, but maintenance. And I know you have so much experience with maintenance, so that's why I'm asking. <laughs> but um, we, so but we install gardens all over the Adirondacks at um, hospitals and schools and different places, community gardens. And what we've been struggling with is after the plants start to get established, some of these native plants we're working with get so tall and so big that they look a little bit like out of place in in the hexagonal raised beds that we use um can you give us some guidelines on you know on cutting them back and when to cut back and i'm sure it varies from plant to plant but how do you 
how do you kind of keep these things a little bit more ruly in a, in a <laughs> setting? Well, and yeah, that's just, that's plant selection. The thing with these plants is if they're getting a minimum of six hours a day and they're happy where they are and they are in good nutrient rich soil, and you said they're raised planters. So you really have, have um, you know, given these plants everything that they possibly will need to thrive, they're going to thrive and they're going to get large. They're going to get tall. They like where they are. So, you know, in, in that sense, it's, it's a matter of, um, you know, because one of the things with the pollinator gardens is you don't necessarily want to cut everything back. Like I, I'm a big fan and believer with pollinator gardens that you leave everything up all winter and don't tend to it to the springtime. Um, in that early, you know, but not too early spring, but, um, you know, after that last frost and everything and, and your ground temperatures get to about 50 degrees. Um, but so plants, again, they're kind of like children, some grow tall, some grow short, you know what I mean? But if they really like where they are, they they do have a tendency to outgrow some spaces. So that really just comes down to plant selection and trying to find smaller natives that are going to, you know, kind of fit that space. Um, because, you know, the, the rule with the pollinators are you, you don't want to cut them down at any real stage of, of their growing cycle um, because, you know, it feeds, you know, at different, at different times of the pollinators, you know, from the larvae all the way, you know, to the, to, to the full grown, you know, butterflies. So we want to make sure we provide food for them at all times. And if you cut them down in the, in the middle of their growth cycle, you will be um, eliminating some of that food source for them that they've come to rely on because they've come to your garden for that. So again, it, it all just comes, to, I think that comes down to plant selection. Um, Thank you, Jackie. That's helpful. So um, Betsy wants to know if she can move the perennials around this time of year when she finds new spots she wants to put them in, or if there's another time of year you'd recommend. Well, to ideally the best time is, 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 fall and spring, early spring and, and later fall, either if you do decide to cut down your perennials um, in the fall, once they're cut back, it kind of sends that message to the, the roots of the plant that it's time to start working on establishing those, reaching, you know, finding nutrients to the roots. So a fall is a great time for transplanting after you've cut things back. But the other great time is that early spring, um, because as things just kind of start to, to grow up, like for example, sedum, for example, um, it's one of the first perennials that comes up and you can see where it is and it's makes, it just makes it a lot easier to transplant. When things get larger and their broad leaves are larger, they require more water to, to uh, sustain that their um, broad leaves. And so we absolutely now, I mean, we transplant all year, all year long, um, all growing season, but it just, it's watering tendencies that have to change um, when you do plant, um, you know, when you, when you divide and, and, and separate in the summertime, I definitely would not recommend it in any temperatures, probably over 85 degrees or more. That's probably even too hot. I mean, even, you know, the ideal temperatures are probably in the sixties to seventies, cooler nights, um, the other thing that's nice about the fall is when you do get those cooler nights, it does help, the, you know, retain that moisture, which then comes back to the mulch and that whole, you know, situ you know that whole discussion again, um, you know, mulch retains water. But the biggest thing when you separate is, is um, you making sure that you give it the water that it needs to, to try to establish that. Okay, great. Um, Robin wanted to know um, how large of an area our pollinator seed packets will cover. And so Robin, um, it's roughly 20 square feet, so four by five, um, or however else you want to calculate the area. But, um, but yeah, each packet covers 20 square feet. And um, as Jackie mentioned earlier, uh, during the Zoom session today, it's really hard to get them to establish over existing lawn. So we'll want to expose the soil before you plant those and then water them in. You'll also find that the first year with our seed packets, you won't get many blooms until say August, late August, especially if you're planting now. So um, if it looks a little bit unruly at first, it's because those are natives and otherwise, you know, sometimes misconstrued as weeds. So it will look a little bit messy at first and then you'll start to see some more of those blooms in the fall. And some of the varieties won't even bloom until the second year. So that's all totally normal and to be expected. And definitely um, let those seed heads, like Brittany was talking about, like the echinacea and things like that, let them go to seed, let them, you know, and if you do want to deadhead anything, don't remove them from the garden, just simply snip them, deadhead them and let them fall and those seed pods hopefully will generate new plants for you in the spring. I mean, it's just, it's that constant cycle. 
And then Betsy Brooks wanted to know, she said she has sneeze weed that flops over. So she's thinking of cutting it back at some point um, so that they would still flower. Is now a good time? If she has to cut it back, is now, I'm assuming before they flowered, the best time to do it? Yeah, and when you cut things back now, what it's going to do is it's going to make them bushier. Um, and as long as you do it early enough, that gives them a long enough time to generate a new bud, you should be okay. I mean, like here on our farm, for example, things like snapdragons, um, celosia, things like that, we pinch them back early on. Um, we've already done the first round of pinching back, but it's the same kind of concept because we want things to spread more um, horizontal rather than vertical. So you just want to make sure that, it, but if they've started to already push buds on them, um, you know, you can do it. It's just going to take a longer time for them, for them to bloom. So long story short, yes, you certainly can do it now, but, you know, just, I wouldn't wait too much longer because then you're just going to run the risk of not having them bloom before, you know, our season's over. Unfortunately, we do have that short season up here at the Adirondacks. Great. Um, so Jen has a question about um, a normal meadow. So she's really trying to make her normal meadow thrive this year. Um, do you have any suggestions to increase biodiversity in the meadow in this area that she doesn't mow at all? Um, and at the moment, the grass and moss has taken over. Right. And, you know, it, it is it is difficult, just like with a pollinator garden, meadows are really hard to establish. I mean, we can drive by and see these people that have these most gorgeous meadows, but we can't expect that those happened overnight or not naturally. Um, you know, for example, I was just driving out on the Highlands Road and there's one meadow out there that has so much gorgeous wild lupin in it. And I mean, I would love that, but I, you know, I mean, it's, it would take me years and years to establish that. The biggest thing is, you know, you have to kind of embrace the area that you're in. And sometimes, you know, I mean, if, if moss is taking over, it means you have a very, you know, wet and, and um, shady area for sure. And moss will continue to grow. You can't really fight it. Sometimes it's better to let things be and naturally as they are and maybe try to find a smaller area somewhere else that you can try to establish, establish that meadow. But moss, moss is one of those things that, you know, creates itself in a very specific environment um, with with soils with um, water and and with with light um, so the biggest thing is you know who know I mean is is the meadow do you have trees in that area like why is it really shady anything like that that's that's growing I mean is no, there, I mean there is some happens? there's definitely some shade um, but I had right. heard using like plugs I don't know if anyone else has used that like just getting smaller plugs of plants and putting those in. Um, I'm yeah, just trying anytime to- Anytime that you can, it. yeah, anytime you can get plugs in there, your chances are are better than seeding for sure. Cause it just, it gives the plants a little bit of an edge and an, and an upper hand to, to establish themselves um, rather than trying to fight what's already there. If that makes sense. Yeah, But great. yeah, Thank plugs you. are a great way to go. And maybe some white turtle head or something else that likes that really wet environment. Yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah, I've seen these really cool little biodegradable discs. They're about this large that you can put around plant starts that just kind of like help to give it a competitive edge against the grass or sure. anything that's encroaching. So that's another best practice. Wonderful. So Jackie, if what advice would you give to someone who installs their pollinator garden this June and, you know, come July, August, it's really, things aren't really thriving. Would you recommend then adding any additional fertility or, you know, what are some troubleshooting tips and tricks that people can do if, if things aren't taking off the way they had hoped? Yeah, I mean, it, you know, as I said too, gardening is definitely a process. It's a series of ups and downs. As you said, even the seeds that you, that you, you know, you guys are distributing everything. I mean, it's fantastic, but they do look unruly for a little bit. Um, and you just have to kind of stay the course. Certainly um, we do feed with like a, a fish oil. Um, it's all, you know what I mean? It's a Neptune's harvest fish oil, which, which we use here on the farm. Um, but, you know, just kind of staying on top of things, um, you know, you know, if it hasn't rained, make sure you're, you're giving the, the plants that it, it, it needs. Pinching back, as I said, is, is another way to make things more vigorous. 
um, different messages to the plants rather than, as I said, growing so vertical, trying to get things more horizontal. Um, you certainly can add sprinkle and compost, you know, throughout the season, but just make sure you really water it in. It's not going to do you any good just to sprinkle in the compost it and then just let it dry up on top either. So, you know, it's just, it's, it's definitely a process. Um, you have to kind of be an all in um, and, and understand that, you know, it is going to look a little un unruly at the beginning, but once those plants start to establish themselves, um, you know, with the proper care and nutrients. Um, and, you know, another thing too, that you can also do is you can take, you know, just like, you know, I don't, we use trachs, I don't know, um, you know, just like a little, like a garden claw to kind of aerate the soil as well, also to try to get some more oxygen into that soil, um, especially if you've had rain for a long, long time. We have a sunflower patch, um, one of the where you pick areas. It's new to us this year, but um, we've tilled and tilled um, as much, you know, and added all sorts of organic rich um, nutrients, but we're letting it go wild, but planting sunflowers in it. But we had that two weeks of rain and it hardened like cement. Um, so, you know, we're going through and, and hoeing things and trying to get some more, you know, it's, it's like an aeration kind of method. Um, so you can you know, definitely check your soils and, and your soils are going to tell you your, you know, your whole, the whole kind of, you know, gamut of, of how well your plants are going to do. You want to make sure that you've, you've got everything, you know, non-compact, nice and open and airy and, and enriched with, with good organics. That's great. So on that soils question again, um, if someone is eager to get started and they don't feel like they want to invest the time of getting a soil test, um, do you have any just really basic tips and tricks or things to look out for as you're preparing your garden site to plant? Yeah, I mean, you want to have, I mean, clay is one thing. I mean, it, you know, it's a matter of being able to identify your soil types. Um, clay is going to hold a lot of moisture and, and really harden in the dry, dry, um, you know, the dry, dry summer, you know, if we don't have a lot of rain, things like that. So when you have a lot of clay and um, you, you do want to try to break that down, natural wood chips are great for that. Um, to break that down, um, you know, leaves, any kind of debris like that, that you obviously know where it comes from, um, is good to mix into the clay soils. Um, if you're more sandy and rocky, um, you know, still you're going to want to put compost in. I mean, I don't know if there's anything such thing as like the perfect soils either, because every plant does require different drainage, different nutrients, but sandy soils, um, you know, do require, you know, it, it allows the plants to drain, but remember that it won't hold as much moisture either. So that's where then you, if you do enrich it with compost or put mulch on top, it will help to retain some of that moisture. Um, again, though, with, with the native soils or the native plants up here, that's the one great thing about planting natives is they are hardy. They are, you know, they're, they're from here. So they, they're used to growing in different, you know, in, in our environment. Um, you know, even when we buy plants um, for a landscaping company, I make sure everything is grown up here in the Northeast because I know that we need to, you know, they, I want them to overwinter. I want them to do well. And if, if I get say, you know, some, some perennials or some trees from Florida or from Georgia, they aren't used to our soils up here and it's going to take them longer to establish. So that's one really, that's a big, big pro about going with natives. Um, you know, the other thing you just have to be careful about with these cultivars are they, you know, they, so many different cultivars now they're trying you know these nurseries they're trying to make certain plants bloom better and bloom bigger and bloom a little bit of different color and things like that but the more um, modified these plants have gotten over the years the less pollination like the less pollen that they're cre are they're creating um, with these newer um, these, these new cultivars and it's kind of, they're getting really complicated for our pollinators to even find the pollen on, on some of these, um, you know, flower heads and buds and things like that. So just really it's, you know, and, and I'm sure Christian talked about that, you know, a month ago too. I mean, he's fantastic and so knowledgeable, um, you know, and he's a great resource for us as well in this, in this company, in the business that we're in, but you know, that's, it's definitely something to take in consideration is where the plants are grown, what you know the use of the plants are, and you know that's why it's great to go with the native and and older heirloom varieties of things because they're just they're classic, and that's what we kind of need to get back to um, in this area um, to to help the pollinators in the Adirondacks for sure. That's great advice, Jackie. Thank you so much. 
Well, I think we've gotten through all of our questions. So I just wanna thank everybody for your great engagement. Thank you for all of your questions. Thanks for joining us today and listening. And Jackie, thanks most of all to you for sharing your knowledge with us. Um, thank you also for op offering up your beautiful farm as one of our pickup yeah, sites. We're looking forward to it. Thanks, we are too. So um, next week, uh, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, we'll do it. We're doing the plant sale pickup at the Vic at Paul Smith's. Um, again, it was all pre-order. So if you haven't pre-ordered, there's still a few varieties left, but we're mostly sold out, unfortunately. But you'll find a couple of good things if you're still looking. Um, and then we're going to be doing the the pickup in Keysville at Jackie's Flower Farm um, next Saturday. And I believe we have that on the schedule for 11, 11 to one. Is that right, Christina and Jackie? Sure. <laughs> Anytime you want to come, we're here. We're here all day. Yeah, so it'll be a really fun opportunity to, to see the farm, um, see the beautiful gift shop, and even buy a bouquet if you'd like to join us there next Saturday. So thank you so much again, Jackie, for your time and for offering up your space. And um, we're thinking about doing a pollinator happy hour in person with real drinks sometime this summer. I wonder if anybody here is interested in that. A couple of thumbs up. <laughs> All right, great. So we're gonna think a little bit more about that and try to plan something, but it'd be really nice to be together in person after this crazy year that we've all been through. So look out for uh, for uh, hopefully an invitation to that later this summer. And, um, and thank you all again so much for your time. I have just a couple more last announcements at the end before Brittany shuts her computer and finishes her, her happy hour beverage. <laughs> um, we mentioned the Mossbrook pickup, but I just wanted to review the other pickup dates because I know we have a lot of people picking up their plants that are on the call today. So we also have the Vic at Paul Smith's College on June 10th, 11th, and 12th from 10 to 2 p.m. each day. The Minerva Beach Pavilion on June 10th from 3 to 6 p.m. The in and the Indian Lake Library on June 12th from 12:30 to 3 p.m. And those are all also at our website at adkaction.org slash plant sale, not pant sale. Um, we're also installing a lot of community pollinator gardens um, through our pollinator garden assistance program this spring. And if you are interested in volunteering to help plant one of those gardens, uh, you can head over to our website at adkaction.org and under get involved, you'll find a volunteer tab and you can put that in there or just send an email to info at adkaction.org letting us know that you wanna volunteer to help out with that and we will hook you up. Um, as Brittany mentioned, we're thinking of um, having a live pollinator happy hour, um, which would be amazing. I'm hoping that someday in the not too distant future, we can uh, toast the successes of our pollinator garden. I wanted to thank all of our participants that showed up for our virtual pollinator hours and sharing all of your expertise as well. Um, you're really helping us all become more informed pollinator advocates here. Um, I know I learned quite a bit and all our guest experts. Um, all of the pollinator, uh, the Adirondack Pollinator Project is funded through donations and membership support at ADK Action. So if you would like to make a donation to support the Adirondack Pollinator Project, I'll drop a link in the chat or if you go to adkaction.org slash pollinator, it's about halfway down the page, you can donate directly to the project um, or you can become a member of ADK Action if you wanna support all of our diverse portfolio of projects throughout the year with one annual donation. Um, I've really enjoyed this and I wanna thank all of you. And um, one last special shout out to my mom who was able to join today. She's an excellent pollinator gardener and I'm happy she was finally able to make one of these. Everyone have a great afternoon and I look forward to seeing you in person someday soon and especially at the plant sale pickup. <laughs> thank thank you. you. Thanks everybody. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.